All right, so we start the free paper session. And um, we have Dr. Dr. Shahi, and I'm Dr. Fairuz. And all the very best. So we'll have our first uh, presenting author, Dr. Prasenjit Kalita. So we're very strict about the timing. If you exceed your timing, there is a minus mark. Okay, so keep on to your uh, time. Your timer hit kar do four five minutes says for seven to rakhe. No, five minutes. Five, hai na? It's five minutes. Five minutes is it? Uh, guys, it's five minutes. Yeah, I'm forgetting. Five. five minutes. Achha, two minutes. So Dr. Prasenjit uh, Kalita will be presenting on site threatening orbital cellulitis from osteomyatal sinusitis due to mixed infection. A case report, over to you. Yeah. Start ma'am. Okay. Good morning respected judges. I am going to present a case report on site threatening orbital cellulitis from osteomyatal sinusitis due to mixed infection. There is no financial support. Orbital cellulitis is a serious infection that involves muscles and fat located within the orbit. The causative organism are bacterial but also be a polymicrobial including aerobic, anaerobic, and fungal and mycobacterium. To the it is important to diagnose the investigate to determine if the source is from the sinuses as it is closely associated with the orbits are and are commonly the source of infection. Treatment with antibiotics for aerobes and anaerobes is important along with the antifungal drug when a fungal infection is suspected. It requires multidisciplinary team of ophthalmologists, anti specialists, infection specialists, and neurosurgeon. Here, uh, a 55 years diabetic male presented with swelling of the left side of the face, diminution of vision of left eye, pain, tosis since last 7 days. He is a known case of diabetic for last 10 years with CKD. He had fever, pallor, and central obesity. His visual equity in right eye is 6 by 12 and in left eye is finger count in 3 meter. Enter segment of the right eye was normal with few dot femoris with an heart exuded. In their left eye, there is a swelling of the lids, severe ptosis, erythema, tenderness, mild ptosis, total ophthalmoplasia, and swelling of the left side of the face. IOP is digitally high. Enter segment of the left side shows severe congestion, chemosis, sluggish reacting people, and early cataract changes. Few dot femoris and heart exuded surrounding the macula in the retina. He developed pastoral swelling in the left axillary area 3 to 4 millimeter in after seven, 11 days. The blood perimeter deranged with increased WBC, neutrophil, uh, sugar, sugar, urea creatinine, and decrease in hemoglobin and other blood parameters. CT nose and PNS shows mucosal thickening and multiple air focus in the left, left maxillary sinus and its model air cells. Rectal muscles are edematous on the left side with intracranial fat standing. Inferior terminates are hypertrophic, it suggested an osteomyotal pattern of sinusitis. MRI orbit shows elephant collection with soft tissue swelling involving the left orbital, zygomatic, maxillary, and mandibular area. There are left or retro orbital inflammatory changes with proptosis suggesting of the orbital cellulitis. The optic nerve shows normal intensity. So it's a case of orbital, orbital cellulitis with left sided osteomyotal sinusitis. Initially, he was treated with broad spectrum antibiotics, prepracillin and aspectum, uh, insulin and analgesic anti inflammatory drugs and antibiotic drops and eye drops and ointment. Calcium sensitive pass shows clepsila pneumonia and blood culture shows coagulous negative staphylococcus. Thus, it's a orbital cellulitis due to mixed infection. He was switched to IV, linezolite, clindamycin, and liposomal amphotericin B along with the previous medication. He received the medication for seven days. Uh, there was a general improvement, but the vision is deteriorating and to PL negative and ultimately it going to optic atrophy. So this is a pictures day one, day four, and day 14, and the right side shows the, the past calcium sensitive showing clepsular pneumonia and blood calcium sensitive coagulus negative staphylococcus. It's a left side shows city nose and PNS, uh, left eye shows edematous um, uh, proptosis with edematous medial rectus muscle, and right eye shows the MRI pictures. Discussion severe optic cellulitis, it is a mixed infection due to osteomyositis characters by multiple carina pulses, which cause pain, decreased visual equity, tosis, optosis, total ophthalmoplasia, and visual loss occur due to mechanical pressure of the inflamed orbital structure, uh, which leads to the increased IOP, reduced retinal circulation, direct compressive optic neuropathy, or ischemic optic neuropathy. Retinal also show a such kind of cell MRSA, but lost the visions. Clepsular anomaly is developed capsule composed of polysaccharide, which inhibits the phagocytosis of the host and causes severe invasive disease. Uh, as the sinuses of the cavities increases, the osteo appears to be narrow with increasing age, uh, with creating optimal condition for anaerobic bacterial growth. With increasing age, there is a trend towards the more complex infection. 
anaerobes consume oxygen and which encourage the anaerobes to grow. Additionally, anaerobes uh, produce beta lactamase, which inhibit uh, uh, antibiotic ineffective. Conclusion, here we report a case of rapidly progressive orbital cellulitis due to coagulase negative staphylococcus aureus and clepsidra pneumonia in immunochromopus male resulting to be resulting in visual loss and optic atrophy. To conclude, orbital cellulitis warrant a prompt diagnosis, medical and surgical management. There is a de declaration for patient is taken and there is no conflict of interest. Thank you. These are my reference. Thank you, Dr. Kalita, for the presentation. So, uh, just a question. Why did you choose this particular case report and what is the main take home message that uh, you want to because give us? It, uh, because we should not uh, uh, neglect or case because it may be it may be it may be complex uh, uh, it may lead to visual uh, visual loss because he was uh, on I ICU setting we we taking start treatment from oral to uh, IV but in spite of all treatment uh, we patient lost the visions within 11 days that's the problem yes ma'am Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. At last, 11, uh, up, uh, 11 days, he was pale negative, ma'am. Because, ma'am, uh, due to uh, orbital, uh, due to inflammation, uh, 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 there is pre pressure in the, uh, uh, increased pressure in the arrest, uh, increased pressure in the uh, orbit, which led to compressive optimal neuropathy, optimal neuropathy. Uh, d d because he is a case of di diabetic patient, a long-standing diabetic patient. Okay. Already, ma'am, he has a di di some diabetic retinopathic changes in the retina, ma'am. Did you get an ENT examination to rule out some fungal sinusitis or anything? Actually, uh, 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 ENT people also see, but uh, uh, it was uh, not, ma'am. There is no fungal sinusitis, ma'am. Did you get his COVID test also done? Yes, ma'am. No COVID, ma'am. Dr. Shalini, any questions for the speaker? All right, so we go on to the next speaker. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, may I uh, invite Dr. Manjit Boro for the next paper? Dr. Manjit Boro, slides on, please. Thanks. Good morning, respected judges and distinguished delegates present here. So today I'm going to my first pre-paper presentation on modified island pedicle advancement seek flip for optimal reconstruction of cutaneous defect after excisional biopsy of basal cell carcinoma, right lower eyelid. So there is no financial support and sponsorship. So going in introduction, basal cell carcinoma is the most common cutaneous malignancy. It is a slow growing tumor. It can be highly destructive and disfigure local tissues when treatment is inadequate or delayed. Exposure to UV rays is the most important risk factor. It has different types, nodular, superficial, morphiform, cystic, and pigmented form. The current mainstay treatment of BCC includes excision, electrodesiccation, and keratas, cryosurgery, and most microangiographic surgery. Here we present a case of BCC right lower eyelid that underwent modified island pedicle advancement seek flap for optimal reconstruction of cutaneous defect after excisional biopsy. So my case is a 64-year-old male presented with a blackish mass on his right lower eyelid, which was gradually increasing in size. Approximately 10 years earlier, he had developed a small black mass along the infraorbital crease. It was associated with blackish discharge. On ocular examination, his visual acuity in right eye is 624 and in left eye 636, which got corrected with glasses for both far and near. The anterior segment was normal in both eyes, except early cataract changes. A linear blackish mass measuring about 3 into 1 into 0.5 centimeter cube was seen extending from right medial to lateral infraorbital crease. Laboratory tests showed no abnormalities in hematological parameters, and both family and personal medical history are unremarkable. The tumor was completely excised with 3 millimeter margin and a specimen was sent for histopathological examination. The incision, it penetrates the entire thickness of the subcutaneous fat and an appropriate triangle or island is fashioned with its base towards the defect with partial attachment of its uh, superior medial in the superior medial angle. Thus the term modified island flame. 
The flap was rotated towards the defect and sutured with fibrovic reel. The patient was managed postoperatively with systemic and topical antibiotics along with anti-inflammatory and analgesics. Incision biopsy and ASP, it showed tiny strings of stratified squamous epithelium with basal cell proliferation, thus it is suggestive of BCC. So this is the ASP report, uh, figure one shows the ASP and incisional biopsy report and uh, this is the picture uh, of the excision of the mass and modified island pedicle sig flap is created in the figure 2B picture. So this is uh, the figure 3A, it shows the sutureing of the flap uh, in a triangular fashion or island fashion and this is a post of day 1 picture. And it, uh, the figure 4 is, it shows after removal of the suture, the post operative day 14 picture of the case. So discussion modified island pedicle flap has a great degree of tissue mobility than other advancement flaps where anatomy is maintained. The proper size flap pedicle, it consists of subcutaneous tissue with abundant vessels and good blood supply from underlying tissue. It gets perfusion from its attached part. Under benefit, there is maximum matching of the skin color, texture and thickness with the adjacent skin and it is easy to construct the flap. The flap did not create strong tension and has good adaptability. The modified island pedicle flap can be used for almost anywhere in phase. It is not recommended for defects located on the scalp where desirable mortality can't be obtained. So many authors have reconstructed the wounds with island advancement flap. Like Martin Brown Jr., they use the subcutaneous island pedicle flap, which yielded ex excellent functional cosmetic repair of the presented defects with minimum post-operative morbidity. Hyun Kwon used VY advancement flap in the tumors involving scalp, upper limb, and flank with good survival and aesthetic results. Albanis et al. used the modified cuteness advanced flap that proved to be a valuable and safe option in periocular reconstructive surgery with excellent cosmetic results and no postoperative ectropion. The necessity for eyelid tightening as a part of reconstructive process should encourage oculoplastic surgeons to use the modified cuteness advancement flap when reconstructing defects involving medial lower eyelid, infraorbital cheek, and nasal sidewall. So, so with this I conclude that the present case is uh, with this technique we can prevent growth of the tumor, destruction and disfragment of the lo local tissues, thus the modified island pedicle flap can be highly regarded for BCC defects owing to its robust blood supply, color and textural match. So these are all my references. The appropriate concern has been taken from the patients and there is no conflict of interest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boro. Excellent presentation. Ma'am, over to you if you have a question. Very nice presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, my only question, like, you have done a very nice surgery, you have done a good excision, but on the table, in case you do not have a frozen section, the same sit sitting pedicle is usually not advised. Okay, but I can understand your limitations, and I'm sure, like, uh, the margins were clear. But usually, the normal teaching in any cancer case, if you suspect, if you do not have a frozen section, then on the table, any form of switching or pedicle should not be done. But very nice presentation, excellent documentation. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Boro, yeah, the question is in the same term. Did you look for the margins, like e at least when it came back, histopathology? Uh, ma'am, uh, margins were uh, on the, uh, the patient came on day 14. And even the patient came after three months also. Uh, the margins were ma'am normal. Uh, there were no any. Uh, there is no presence of growth. There is no blackish mass also. Okay. So uh, I'm sure you're a resident, right? Yes, ma'am. Third year That's fine. So this is just a discussion. Knowledge wise. Yeah. So whenever we take any uh, malignancy, eyelid, or anything, be it conjunctiva or anything uh, from the eye, it's so very important to assess the margins mm. intraoperatively. We are not talking about post-operative, right? Mm. So post-operatively, when you are assessing him in a slip lamp or whatever, can I have the mic on, please? Yeah, so uh, post-operatively when the patient comes, it's not microscopic evidence, right? Mm. You're just looking with your naked eye and you feel, okay, everything is fine. Mm. So these patients with malignancy, be it BCC, be it uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, sebaceous gland carcinoma, intraoperatively, we should make sure that whatever you excise, one, you go for a wide margin. Clinically, you know the you know extent of the tumor, and from that, we you go ahead 
around 4 millimeters. Sometimes in melanoma, we even go up to 10 millimeters mm -hmm. margin, clear okay. margin okay. for my naked eye as a surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. So it's my naked eye. I still mm -hmm. don't know whether there is microscopically something infiltrating there. Mm -hmm. We take it out. We send it to hist histopathology lab, okay. okay? So if you want the report immediately, it's called frozen section, okay? So they do a cryostat. They will have in a histopathology laboratory. Immediately, they cut the margins and tell us, well, the margins are negative. Only if they report to us that the margins are negative, mm -hmm. we reconstruct, okay. okay? Now, in certain uh, hospitals, government hospital, I learned as a postgraduate from a government hospital. We didn't have the facility of frozen section. So the option that you have as a surgeon is you give it to the histopathology lab, you wait for it. There is no hurry to reconstruct, okay? okay. For us, outcome of the patient is more important, mm -hmm. yeah? Cosmesis is important. We are all oculoplastic surgeon. It is important. But as far as malignancy is concerned, the outcome is recurrence, okay. metastasis, and death, mortality, okay. right? Yeah. So we wait. And then if they don't have the frozen section thing, we request the pathologist, can you give us the report at least in three to four days, just assessing the margin so that I can reconstruct it. So this has to be ingrained inside your brain. Everyone, wherever, whichever part of India or world that you are. So that is so very important. Excellent, good reconstruction, good pedicle, but that is secondary. Primary is what? We want a completely clear margin in malignancy and that should be the loud message okay. that goes out from this presentation okay. thank you thank you ma'am for enlightening us thanks yeah, a lot very ma rightly ma'am has said but uh, india every ideal thing is not possible <laughs> very i think three four days is also too early in a government hospital to ask for a report it takes let's not less than 10 to 15 days for a routine report to come so obviously we should strive for that, but n as of now, I am sure this is still not possible in most of the colleges. So we have to go based on our own clinical acumen. Okay, ma'am has asked in the cases very nicely. Can I ask you something out of the way? Did you check for the other eye also? He has a big staring look with a lot of lid retraction. Did you uh, ex uh, investigate uh, for that? Yeah, ma'am, we have checked. Uh, ma'am, the patient is already... Not related to the BCC, yeah, I'm yeah, just yeah. asking you. Ma'am, uh, the patient is already consulting with endocrinologist. So he has ma'am thyroid disorder also ma'am. So that's why maybe he has you could have just mentioned it in your findings because that was a quite significant visible finding. Yes ma'am. Otherwise obviously the presentation was nice and very nicely done. Mm -hmm. Normally advancement flaps can also be done but this was also a very good and nicely done option you did. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot ma'am. Thank you judges. Dr. Shalini. All right. So we go on to the next presenter of the day, Dr. Shubha Parshad. Over to you. Safety enhanced tarsofrontal sling surgery for complex ptosis. May I start, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. At the outset, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present at the uh, midterm. Uh, today, I would be speaking on safety-enhanced tarsofrontalis link surgery in cases of complex ptosis. Safety-enhanced tarsofrontalis link surgery is considered only in cases of severe ptosis, where we are dealing with two primary things. One is an ocular motility restriction and two, a poor Wells phenomena. In our assessment, the mean age at presentation was 32 plus 20.8 years with the interquartile range of, uh, and the range of five months to 69 years. Of the study population, we had 68% were males and 32% were females. 25 patients and 39 eyes were analyzed. The clinical spectrum of the complex doses we had uh, where first is chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia with 36% of the cases were of this subset, where apart from a severe ptosis and ocular motility restriction, we are also dealing with a progressive weakening of the orbicularis oculi muscle, 
Second, uh, congenital causes along with monocular elevation deficiency and those doses with uh, poor Bell's phenomena which constituted 20% of our cases. 8% were blepharophimosis uh, syndrome cases and 20% accounted from trauma and other causes like third cranial nerve palsy. Now the methodology involved a retrospective interventional case series where the study duration was 2014 to 2022 and 39 eyes underwent the surgery where we assess for the severity of ptosis and we used the 800 micron silicon sling. The idea of using silicon sling for as a su suspension material because it allows a complete closure of the lid against its inherent property of elasticity, the ease of adjustment if needed at a later date and because it remains non-integrated with the surrounding tissues, the sleeve can be easily lifted off from the depth of the incision. The technique we followed was a Fox suspension method and the outcomes were two uh, primary ones which included one is the change in the amount of ptosis and second in terms of the ocular surface integrity analyzing the exposure of the corneal surface. The analysis involved mean follow up was 12.9 months and uh, all patients had clearance of visual access with a mean change in the MRD1 of 2.9 mm and exposure keratopathy and recurrence are noted in 4% uh, of our cases. So this is uh, a patient where we can see a clearance of the visual axis. The idea in a case of a safety enhanced tarsofrontalis link surgery is a willful or a voluntary under correction such that we are not exposing the corneal surface and second is to do an extreme lateral tarsorophy which would decrease the incidence of exposure keratopathy. This is again a case uh, pre and post operative six months where the visual axis is clear and ocular surface integrity was maintained. It also allows for a uh, maintenance of an aesthetic outcome to our surgery where a desired lid height and a symmetrical position of the lids as ocular plastic surgeons also becomes a pivot to our surgery. And no, no patient in our series actually required a sling removal and uh, safety enhanced TFS surgery is preferred in complex doses because of these reasons. It clears the visual axis, which is important. It give a, gives a good functional and aesthetic outcome and minimizes the risk of an exposure keratopathy. These are my references. Thank you. You have mentioned the term safety enhanced. What yes. do you mean by that? Ma'am, safety enhanced because in the subset of cases, for example, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, where we are dealing with a progressive weakening of the orbicularis oculi muscle and also ocular motility restriction, we uh, undercorrect the uh, ptosis such that we are just clearing the visual axis, one. Second, we do an extreme lateral tarsorophy where we are uh, maintaining the tarsorophy in place for a minimum of three weeks and following these patients up on a daily basis so that we are decreasing the risk for exposure keratopathy, hence a safety enhanced. Very nice presentation. You had four percentage of exposure keratopathy, yes, right? So actually the main cause of this ex exposure keratopathy is basically the leg of thalamus. So these patients, what they happen when you use a sling, which leads to a very static lift of the um, upper lid. Yes. So now what we advocate basically for all CPOs or the myasthenia, it is a frontalis flap advancement. Why we do this gives a very educated correction number one, you do not get leg of thalamus. So, so many papers, so many reports have come up that all cases of myasthenia or cases of CPO or a very severe ptosis, this is a better option because you don't get leg of thalamus. And that is what we want, to give the safety. We don't want leg of thalamus. We don't want the eye to open at night, which leads to exposure keratopathy. Anyways, it's a good documentation, but you should consider this technique also, because this is the only technique where we don't say leg of thalamus following the surgery. Sure, ma'am. Okay. Will do, ma'am. Thank you. How long you are supposed to follow up these cases? Ma'am, since this is, these are cases of complex doses where we know that the ocular surface might get compromised and there is a poor bells with restricted motility, we uh, follow them up on a daily basis. No, in initial post-operative period, what is the, your follow-up schedule? And in late post-operative period? In initial post-operative period, ma'am, it is daily basis, ma'am. We follow no, them. Cases were admitted? No, ma'am. Oh, no. uh, 
uh, we do not admit ma'am they uh, do come uh, for a follow up uh, to our hospital yes uh, excellent presentation shubhav and very good slides can i have the last slide of yours doctor ka presentation yeah this one yeah. yeah so what is the safety enhancement in this and this is post op like one year post -op. <laughs> <laughs> no i mean just a discussion right yeah yes, so probably you picked up a wrong image yeah maybe yeah right yeah. yeah so you have to be very careful when you're presenting when you're mm. talking and you know bringing up a message yes, right so this doesn't look safety enhanced mm -hmm. right yeah we'll now uh, a second question that i have for you is when we talk about monoocular elevation deficiency med do you take your squint specialist opinion yes uh, ma'am definitely yeah. because the uh, the basic idea is the lid follows the globe and uh, in cases of monocular elevation deficiency the idea is to correct the hypotropia first under the guidance of a squint specialist and then reassess doses uh, following which the need for surgery can be uh, determined all right yeah good yeah so that is so very important right yeah so it is kind of a teamwork between the squint specialist and oculoplasty and first they go to the squint and then yes. they come to the oculoplasty now in your case series uh, was there any case where you had to actually bring it down because of the exposure post surgery or everyone did perfect Uh, Ma'am, uh, one case we had exposure keratopathy. Ma'am, and what did you do for that? Ma'am, it was managed uh, medically. Medically, yes, you didn't bring down. We didn't have to revise the surgery per se. Okay, okay, uh, that was a question. So sometimes, you know, uh, a sling, as you know, Ma'am said, it's an excellent technique. But uh, when we use a silicone sling, if at all there is a corneal exposure keratopathy, it's always easy to, you know, undercorrect. You can, you just have to go there and. loosen it up so that is one of the advantage no, of using have. a silicone yeah, sling yeah. ma'am thank you yes thank you ma'am message i when i wanted to as the message is definitely that for vertical squints the squint should always be operated taken up first what was the sling material that you used ma'am 800 microns uh, silicone yeah. sling ma'am mm. uh, the uh, we prefer to use bd visitech but uh, we also have a second option of oro sling too So, did you find any uh, uh, compare between Visitech and Orosling? Did you find the complications, which are often said they are more in Orosling, the granuloma um, formation? One, one thing uh, definitely which we can put across is uh, the tightness of the sleeve. The diameter of the sleeve is a bit narrow in Orosling, ma'am, as compared to the BD Visitech, ma'am. And uh, uh, while while you did this study, yes, did you find the check the incidence of Bell's phenomena? You never didn't mention. Or what did you find? How many patients had a poor Bell's phenomena or fair? Or did you try to find that? All all these cases, thirty nine eyes had had a poor Bell's phenomena. Poor Bell's phenomena. Yes, ma'am. So under correction, we already know that we do when we have a poor Bell's phenomena. And yes, the Starso Refi you have added. Were you doing the Starso Refi in all the cases? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That all is cases you yes. did a lateral Starso Refi e in a routine. Extreme lateral Starso Refi. Yes. And uh, a Fox Pentagon was your first choice, or mm. did you think of trying the double triangle also at any time? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, we uh, performed it. It was performed by a single surgeon, and uh, Fox Pentagon was our method of choice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Very good. Yeah. So we go on to the next presenter. Uh, we have Dr. Ashit Shah. Ashit Shah, okay. Uh, Gemini Pandya, Dr. Gemini Pandya. No. Modwadia Jayesh. We have Absindis. Uh, Dr. Ketan, not there. Dr. Sanjri Malhotra, not there. Dr. Dona Matthews, not there. Dr. Aishwarya B, not there. Very easy competition. <laughs> You're anyway going to get first, second, and third, right? Yeah. Cross the table. I think one more is there. No, 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 no. no. Oh yeah, and the other person. You presented well, but you're not a ratified member, so we are not judging you. So we have a gold medal and a silver medal already. Perfect. So uh, something that I really want, being postgraduate resident, even I have done these mistakes when I was a PG. whenever you present okay this is for the first two presenters okay. when you're talking about a clinical presentation of the patient so you wrote so many things in your slides like blah 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 and then you're showing your image in another somewhere okay so it's always good to show an image 
for the audience, for anyone to correlate to what you're speaking. You said so many things, by the time the image is coming, you're just showing it there. Okay, so if you saw Shubhav, right, yeah. He put the image there and then he's talking about it. So for us as an audience, be it a case presentation, be it another session instruction course, it's always easy for the audience to correlate to whatever. So you're putting a BCC picture there and then you're explaining about the lesion. It is this millimeters, it's in the inferior lid, blah, whatever the information, da, da, da. So it's always the image which should, should be there, not the image coming later. All right. Now, when you're talking about surgical uh, flap, you know, you spoke about just put images like as uh, you also put, you know, or body cellulitis picture. So it's always good to put more pictures so that people understand it better and reduce the sentences in your slides. You know, just put bullet points next time when you present. It is more impressive as a presenter. No one is going to read the entire sentence. Anyway, you're speaking, we're listening to you, right? So it should be highlighted, bullet points, which should come on the slides next time. Okay, all of you are here as PGs. All right, yeah. Excellent, we had a good time. Do you have any questions for us, if you want to discuss, because we have time. We don't have other presenters here. I have a uh, few queries, basically, for myself. Yeah. Suppose it's a case of neurogenic cases, complex uh, cases, where we uh, safety enhanced what he was talking about. Uh, exposure keratopathy develops. So in subsequent follow-ups, how do we decide to, uh, the, uh, he said he will undercorrect it. So uh, in my case, I'm going to present in the next one, exposure keratitis developed on uh, fifth, sixth day post-op. So I did tarsoplantar sling because in literature, there is some people, they do LPS resection, but my mine is not so accurate. So obviously tarsoplantar sling is the only choice for me. So whether I'll undo it surgery or try to undercorrect it or rather wait it, what should be the protocol? So well, that's the question that I asked uh, Shubhav in a series, whether they had to undercorrect it. It depends upon the severity of the keratopathy and the severity of the, the Bell's phenomenon, right? Yeah, so if you feel that the cornea is going for infiltration and ulcer, mm -hmm. obviously you want to undercorrect, depending upon how Mine visually- Mine responded just in one day. Say, uh, Topical lubrication every hourly I started. Then I didn't want good. to undo then the it's surgery. Good. Yeah, yeah, so when we do such cases, initially post-operatively, the first six weeks is very important because yeah. even at first, even if you don't do this uh, safety enhanced in a regular doses where you're using mm -hmm. the sling, the first one week you can see that the lid is really high yeah. and the bells are bad and the closure is bad. But subsequently, even with a frontalis flap or with a sling, the lag of thalmos reduces. Yeah, it so you can actually safely observe it, making sure that the surface is lubricated very well. You can go for hourly lubrication. That's what Apart I did. Apart from that, we use gel four times oh, yeah. a day. That and did. gel at bedtime for sure, whether, mm. whether it's an evening fiesta, mm. a morning nap, or an evening, uh, I mean, bedtime nap. Whenever the child or the patient goes to sleep, a gel has to be applied. So initially, you can safely observe it. And frost suture for uh, one week, yeah. yes. Usually you, we keep it for one week. Suppose these cases, if it goes into complication, can we keep it for longer yes, period? If you're using proline suture, then no, no. Uh, proline is okay, but sometimes you get that, oh, yeah, uh, you know, pustule and stuff yeah. happening in the lower lid. One week of frost suture is what principally that in we principle, use. In principle, we, we use for one week. Yeah. Yeah. Zarurat, if you're having a doubt that exposure is about to happen or going, you can keep for another four or five days. There's nothing, it's not a hard and fast rule that on the seventh day you have to remove. At least I'm not following that. Which, and itna zada, jo aap keh rahe, I don't know, it, hoti hai patient ko bhi uneasiness, but uh, you have to weigh the pros and cons. If exposure is there, uh, doubtful. And also advise the patient not to sit uh, directly or sleep directly under the fan or just few goggles and everything. These small, small precautions, they are also helpful at time. That is also one option. That's okay. safe. You can, particularly flat, you can keep it for a month. Nothing will happen. Okay. BCL is one of the options. If you see the belt is poor. I have a question to you. Like your, since we, ha do we have time? We have time. We have time. Since okay. it is a BCC, your case, have you done any systemic examination? Because we know something, uh, what is that? gollin uh, gall syndrome. So sometimes we need, because it's an autosomal dominant disease, right? gollin golds So it is very essential to do a very thorough systemic evaluation. 
And nowadays, there are some topical creams also which work so good. Even I use those topical creams. Any case of BCC that we get, it really works very good. In order, sometimes it's a big lesion like yours, we can go for little reduction. Because, because you do not have the frozen section facility, right? And even I understand uh, most of the government medical college, they will not give you the report beyond one week that I have, since I'm also, you're from Arayo Guwahati, right? Myself also, I'm from Arayo Guwahati. So that is, uh, otherwise it's a nice presentation, but you have to do a very thorough systemic evaluation because it's a nevoid. Your case is a nevoid type of basal cell. So now there is a golden question for you, okay? Don't feel embarrassed if you cannot answer it. Anyone can answer. So since ma'am brought up uh, the uh, topic of reduction, okay, with uh, chemotherapy or immunotherapy, are you aware of something, a drug, which is in the market, FDA approved, which is used for BCC, like Gollengott syndrome is where they have multiple BCC, recurrent multiple BCC in the face, in the scalp, so are you aware of any FDA approved drug which has come up where it's used mostly in the United States of America and Australia where it can reduce and vanish the PCCs? Yes, yes, excellent. You get 12 out of 10 for that. So a company name, you know? Oh no, How's, how does it target the mechanism of action? So, Shubhav, you have to help this resident, you being a fellow. You're getting fine. You're getting fined if you don't answer it. If you don't answer, I forgive. If he doesn't answer, I don't forgive. <laughs> yes. What? Tell me. No, ab cycle. What? So if you don't know, you pass over to your senior. Shubhav, not done. Shubhav, I'm meeting you outside after this. Hedgehog pathway inhibitor. Okay, but you said Vismodegib, 12 out of 10 for you. All right, yeah, so Vismodegib, the hedgehog pathway inhibitor, is a newer uh, therapy, a targeted therapy, molecular therapy, where it's extensively used in the West for BCC, extensive BCC, um, BCC extending into the orbit, multiple BCCs as far as Gollengott syndrome is concerned. Awesome, thank you so much, thank you very much. session is up to 955 so we will be waiting for the you know until